Welcome back to Colin's Corner. I'm Colin Campbell, studio manager at Third Coast Percussion in Chicago. On Colin's Corner, we take a behind the scenes look at some of the custom creations that I'm working on for the ensemble. Up until now, Colin's Corner has just been a blog. So thanks for checking that out if you've uh, seen it before. And I'm really excited to reintroduce it now on Third Coast Percussion's YouTube channel as a video segment. So thanks for watching. In this episode, we're gonna take a look at how I went about making an epic slapstick to be used in a newly commissioned work for the ensemble by composer Georg Friedrich Haas. My design brief from ensemble member Sean Connors was pretty simple. It needed to produce, as he put it, epic volume, and he needed to be able to pick it up, play it, and set it back down pretty quickly. And I took it from there. So for materials, I chose a single one inch thick by six inch wide maple plank because maple is really a uh, pretty hard wood and I found a really nice flat board and I decided to just make this, this piece out of just one board of maple with no waste or off cuts. And I decided to use some really simple hand tools like the Japanese woodworking saw that you see me holding there. Um, because I just kind of wanted to get back to basics, show you that you don't always have to have access to a bunch of power tools and a full, a full wood shop and, and kind of modern equipment and that you can kind of, uh, use some really minimal old fashioned tools, uh, with enough know-how and skill. And you can make something that really feels finished, that looks finished and that, that does the job and that you can be proud of. I've already carefully measured and marked my first cut. We'll get into measuring and marking later, but I'm making the first cross cut at 90 degrees to the wood grain, and that's gonna just divide the plank evenly in half. You can see here this uh, Japanese saw has a really thin, flexible blade. You need to use a really light grip. You can't force it through the wood. You have to let the tool do the work. And what's kind of cool about Japanese saws, one reason I really like them, is because they cut on the draw when you, that's a cool sound. You can kind of get a feel for how thin the blade is. But as I was saying, they cut on the draw towards you rather than cu cutting uh, when you push it away from you, like a traditional Western saw. And this gives you really incredible control. And as you can see, you get a really smooth finish right off of the saw. Now let's take a closer look at measuring and marking for this next cut. I'm using an adjustable combination square to measure the distance from the end of the board while making sure that my previous cut was nice and square. Uh, I'm also making several pencil marks across there and I'm gonna switch to a steel uh, engineer square which is not adjustable, it's rigid, but it's very exactly 90 degrees. And I'm gonna use that to actually make my pencil line ultra, ultra precise. This process of marking the wood is ultimately going to determine the final quality and fit of the piece. So I'm being very careful and taking my time with this step. And now that I've checked that the line is indeed square from both sides, I'm going to use my scratch awl here and I'm gonna etch a line in the wood right on top of the pencil line. I'm gonna use that etched line in the wood to kind of be a guide for the saw blade on the first couple of strokes. So it's really, I'm also actually gonna use my engineer square again just to kind of hold against the edge of the blade to make sure that we're square going across the board and going down. It's really, really critical the first couple of saw strokes to to establish a really, really straight line because kind of once you've, once you've had about three or four pulls of that saw through the wood, it's it's already d determined where your where your cut's gonna go. So if you're really 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 careful at the beginning, as you can see, I can just kind of work my way through the the wood uh, after I've established that nice straight line. Those are actually the only two saw cuts for this entire piece. So now it's time to move on to gluing up. A simple process, you make sure to use plenty of glue until you see it squeezing out of your seam there. 
I'm using Jorgensen clamps to clamp everything down nice and flat and I'm just making sure it's really flush. I like to use a damp towel just to clean up ahead of time because it's easier to clean that wood, uh, wood glue when it's wet than after it dries and gives you a cleaner result I think in the end. And that's a wrap on day one, just gotta let the glue dry overnight. And day two, Trooper and I are back at it. The glue has dried, but we're not quite ready to begin assembly. The, before that, I want to drill a couple of speed holes in the top board that will allow Sean to clap this thing together with maximum velocity. I've adjusted my combination square to half the width of the board, and I'm going to measure it from both sides and make a mark to get uh, an even more precise center mark. And then I'm going to reinforce that mark with my awl. Now I'm going to drill the holes using a 7 8 inch diameter spade bit. When drilling all the way through a piece of wood like this, you always want to clamp your workpiece on top of a piece of scrap. This is going to avoid tearing out the wood grain when the bit goes through and it'll give your, your hole a nice finished look on both sides. And the, the, with a bigger spade bit like this, you wanna just start the drill slowly and then build up speed. And you can see I've gone all the way through the wood and into that waste board on the bottom and it's clean on both sides. It didn't tear out when we drilled through it. Now I'm gonna talk about breaking edges. Sharp, unbroken board edges will give your piece an unfinished appearance and unpleasant hand feel. You always wanna break the hard edges of whatever you're working on with sandpaper, a hand plane, like I'm using, or even a router, depending on the look and feel that you're going for. I'm gonna use a pair of hand planes to break these edges, because again, I'm trying to use some old school, uh, minimal, practical tools, and uh, try, to, try to use them to the best of my ability. So, getting some really nice curls of maple coming out of the nose of that plane, or coming out of the mouth of that plane, I should say, it's really, uh, fun to do that really satisfying and uh, I'm just gonna use some sandpaper that I've curved over and I'm gonna show you there look nice round over profile done by hand so it's, it's slower than using a router for sure but uh, again we're kind of trying to go old school with some of this stuff except for the power sander because sanding takes forever I spend so much of my time woodworking, just sanding, sanding, sanding. It's so important to go through the grains, we call it. You can't skip a grain. You know, I started on, I think, since this was a board that I bought that was pre-finished, I started with like 180 and just did 180, 220. But in most cases, you're going to start with 80, On the, in the case of like a refinish, 100, and then work up through 120, 150 sometimes, 180, 220. And uh, it just takes a really, really long time. So I wish I could hit fast forward and do that in real life. But anyways, now I am marking and drilling for the first spring hinge. I have the boards clamped together from the side there with that yellow clamp. That's just making sure that my alignment is staying true as I'm drilling and marking all this. And the process is always I use a pencil and then I use the, the scratch awl and then I actually make my cut or my drill hole. That piece of tape that I have on the drill bit is a depth stop to make sure that I don't drill all the way through that top board. Just go ahead and get that first hinge fitted. So I actually installed this first hinge and before I installed the second hinge I remembered that I actually wanted to do some of the finishing work on the piece. So we'll uh, we'll go on to, the. I probably should have done the, the finishing stuff first and then drilled it in, in this case, but I didn't. But it's okay, it's, uh, it's not going to really affect the final piece too much. Now we're going to talk about finishing. 
There are many, many, many different ways to finish wood. For this piece, I uh, just chose shellac because it's pretty forgiving. You, you sand down to like 220 grit like I did and then you spray the shellac on and then you can sand down again after you spray it on with like 400 grit. Um, and it, it's, it, again, it's, it's more forgiving than using lacquer where you have to get it kind of really perfect before you apply it. It's all, shellac is also really nice because you can uh, do it all in one day. I really like to use some other more high-end finishes, let's say, like a tongue oil or something like that, but they can take a week to really get them right. You have to let them dry 24 hours in between coats and do an awful lot of finish sanding and steel wool. and They look amazing, but for a piece like this, that's not going to be kind of an up-close museum-grade piece, let's say. It's, uh, it's a slapstick, so shellac is good enough. And then the paste wax just makes it a little bit smoother. So it's nice because you can do it all in one afternoon and just be done with it. I said Sean needed to be able to pick this up and put it down easily and also get a really good grip on it. So that's why I chose to use these brass handles. And then again, you see uh, mark with the pencil, mark with the awl, and then make the cut or make the, the drill. Install those on both sides. We're almost there. Just transferring that measure measurement, uh, transferring that position rather of the handle using my square. I'm transferring it across the top of the board, and then I'll drop the blade of that square down to make sure that I'm even on both sides. And that's referential measurement. I like to use that rather than uh, transferring error using trying to make the same measurement twice. If that if that makes sense. All right, here we go. Let's give this thing a crack. Thanks for watching.